conduct symphonies. I conduct one here, the North State Symphony, which performs in Reading and Chico, two towns 75 miles apart in the North State and several other small North State communities. I also conduct the Juneau Symphony in Juneau, Alaska, which is an even smaller city. And even though it's the state capital, it's, it's the kind of place that's inaccessible by road. There are no roads in or out. In fact, it's separated by uh, by hundreds of miles of water from its nearest neighboring towns, and, and there's a, an ice field the size of Rhode Island up behind it. I also conduct the ballet in Bozeman, Montana, so I guess you could say that I've really specialized in conducting classical music in towns where car hearts and cowboy boots vastly outnumber tuxedos. <laughs> now, there's nothing that I like doing more than programming, say, a giant Mahler symphony with a cast of 100 instrumentalists and 150 singers, and doing it to a sold-out crowd right here in one of our isolated towns, which is something that the musical establishment thinks isn't even possible to do. And there's nothing I like more than that than it, looking out at the audience at one of these performances and seeing a guy who just came in off of his fishing boat, sitting next to a woman in a beautiful ball gown, sitting next to a high school couple who were on a date, and maybe a farmer who just came out of the fields. So the term practical visionaries is one that's been used to apply or applied to the speakers who, who talked today. And I guess my practical vision was to make sure that live orchestral performance stayed viable and active here in Northern California. About a decade ago, I took over two orchestras, the Reading Symphony and the Chico Symphony, which were two distinct organizations uh, in towns that are very different in personality and of course separated geographically. Uh, but both orchestras were headed toward bankruptcy and, and probable closure. And I'm sure that most of you have heard the dire circumstances, the statistics about the number of orchestras that have closed, which has been dozens in the last couple of years. And let me tell you, from someone who works on the inside of the nonprofit orchestra world, these days the emphasis is squarely on the non part of the nonprofit in our business. So it became clear to me that unless we took some pretty drastic action, we were in pretty grave danger of losing these orchestras altogether. So what we did was not necessarily unique, but it was certainly unusual in the orchestra world. We took two orchestras from two very distinct and separate cities, merged their organizations, merged their boards, merged their players, created an alliance with the, the university, the California State University, Chico, to make sure that we would have a viable organization, and that organization we called the North State Symphony. Now, the merger didn't happen easily. There were a lot of people in both cities who were a little bit suspicious, afraid that this was a hostile takeover of one orchestra by the other, or a, a, an attempt to lose the identity of an orchestra that had been around for many, many years. But it has been an enormous success, and over the last 10 years, we have seen just amazing growth. We've quadrupled what we do as an orchestra. We've had dramatic artistic growth and financial stability, even in a very difficult economic time for orchestras. And even more interestingly, I think, we've built bridges between two communities that sometimes see themselves as being rivals with each other. And so I suppose this is what makes me a, a practical visionary. But when I stop to think about what it is that I do as a conductor, aside from the obvious, which is I wave a stick at about 85 people on a regular basis, but aside from that, I think about what I do as a conductor and I realize that actually producing live performances of classical music is, is really not very practical at all. And in fact, it not only is it not practical, it, it's really totally impractical. And from a philosophical perspective, I actually think about what we do as being in a complete fight or battle with the very notion that everything that we have to do should be practical. So that, that brings up sort of a, an important issue, which is that putting an orchestra on stage is a, is a totally Sisyphean task. We do the same things over and over and over again. Orchestras are, are too big and too cumbersome uh, and too costly to stand on their own financially. And so we are constantly raising money to put the orchestra on the stage. Every time I put the musicians on the stage, somebody's losing money somewhere that has to be made up by fundraising or by sponsorships or donations, and it would help a lot if we had a king, for instance, who could you know, say, this is my orchestra, has happened in the past. In fact, if we look back, you know, three, four hundred years ago, even back to the 1600s, 
we can see that the process that we go through today is more or less the same process that, that orchestras went through three or four hundred years ago. You still had to gather a group of musicians together, you had to rehearse, and then you put on a performance. And in fact, in most areas of life, we've seen great progress and great gains in efficiency. Better use of people power, better educational processes, uh, better use of tools. You know, we don't farm the way we did 400 years ago. We don't pull plows with, with ox carts. We use tractors. We found new ways and better ways to do things. But in the orchestra, we really do things just about the same as we did back then. 200 years ago, it took two or three or four rehearsals to put on a Beethoven symphony. Next week, when I do a Beethoven symphony, it's still going to take two or three or four rehearsals to put on that symphony. The process of mastering the instruments that we play is more or less the same as it's been for generations. I started studying my instruments when I was about five years old, and I had weekly lessons for the next 20, 25 years. And I started studying with a teacher who started studying when she was five years old, and she had lessons for 25 years. And her teacher started at five years old, and so forth and so forth, for generations back. And in fact, the instruments that we play on haven't really changed in 400 years. You know, we still blow through a metal pipe and we still hand carve reeds that go into a little wooden tube to play an instrument like the oboe or the clarinet. Or, or even worse, we play on a little figure eight shaped wooden box that we string with cat gut, with, with strings that are made from the intestines of animals. Think about that. And then we draw a bow that's made out of the hair from a horse's tail. And that's what we do to make the beautiful sounds that create the symphony orchestra. So we may have gotten better as instrumentalists throughout the centuries, but we certainly haven't become more efficient about it. And there's another even bigger problem today. If I ask you to, in fact, I know so because I, I can see you all tweeting. You, I, I, if I ask you to, I bet a lot of you could pull a smartphone out of your pocket right now. And in addition to that smartphone being able to make phone calls and emails, uh, some of you probably have you know, 100 songs on your phone. Maybe you have 1,000 songs. Some guy over here might have 10,000 songs on his phone. So we have a veritable library of music just sitting out here in the chairs in this, in this very hall. We have gained instant access to music. Then when you go home today, you get in your car, you might have an iPod, you listen to music on your way home in the car, you get home, you have your computer, and it has iTunes on it, or maybe you listen to music on Pandora, or Spotify, or, or, or YouTube. And if you're a little bit old-fashioned, you might still have things we call CDs on the shelves that you play. And, and if you're really old-fashioned, or, or maybe very modern hipster, you have records on the shelf. Right? So you can listen to just about any song, or any piece of music, the moment the desire hits you. Now, the phonograph was invented 130 years ago, and that's when we began to really be able to record music at all. And it came into pretty widespread use 80 or 90 years ago. It's a little bit hard for us to imagine a time when if you wanted to hear, let's say you wanted to hear Franz Liszt, who was the greatest rock star of his day. He was a pianist, but he was the greatest rock star of his day. If you wanted to hear Franz Liszt, you had to travel to a city where he was touring. And if you wanted to hear the latest Beethoven symphony, you had to actually live in Vienna or you had to wait until the sheet music came out, and then you had to buy it and take it home and learn how to plunk it out on your own piano to, to listen to that piece. Now, don't get me wrong, I, I love modern technology. I, I love the access to music. I love my iPod. I have it with me wherever I go. I like being able to dial up, you know, oh, let's, let's hear George Sell play Brahms with the Cleveland Orchestra in 1964 today. Or, you know, change my mind and instantly be able to pull up Ella Fitzgerald singing. I mean, I think it's a great thing, but it brings up a really important question, which is why do we do live performance of classical music? And especially, why do we do it here? Why do we do it in this small western town? And, or even more importantly, why do we do it in a little remote Alaskan city? Now, artists tend to be the worst people to answer that question. We tend to be our worst advocates, because you ask an artist why art's important, and they often ponder for a minute, and they say, because it is. But that answer is really not good enough. I mean, yes, I can go on all day about how music elevates you and, and uplifts you and raises, raises, does something for your soul, but that doesn't really answer the practical question of why should we be doing music right here, right now. And so those of us who, who do advocate for live music have to be prepared for a lot of arguments against what it is that we do. In fact, I hear all the time people say things like, you know, the orchestra 
it's not really relevant. I mean, it's just not really relevant to our lives today. Or I hear this a lot. Kids today are raised on TV and, and you know, MTV and video games, and they just don't have the attention span that it takes to listen to an orchestra play for half an hour or an hour. Or the worst one, the one that bothers me the most, is that the orchestra, oh, that's elitist. That's just for a few people who like to show off. They like to show off their knowledge. They like to show off their clothes. <laughs> it's true. But despite, I mean, it's not true they want to show off their clothes. It's true that I hear that all the time. They may want to show off their clothes too. Despite really overwhelming arguments against the practicality of orchestras, I believe that orchestras play an important role because of one very practical reason, and that is that the audience experience of coming together to hear a performance is an extraordinary and powerful expression of community that we really don't get anywhere else. And it doesn't matter if that community is in Chicago, Illinois, Chico, California, Philadelphia, or Reading. The act of coming together to be part of an audience requires individual sacrifice. I mean, you have to buy a ticket. Maybe you have to get a babysitter. You have to drive to the performance. That may be a long distance drive. It may be through the storm. It might be at night. You might not like to drive at night. You have to park. You have to get, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There are a lot of factors, impediments to coming together to be part of an orchestra. It's easier to take your favorite Beethoven CD and stick it in your CD player and just listen to I mean, one of the great performances of history. And in fact, people ask me a lot as a conductor. They say, hey, Kyle. You know, is it really better to hear this live? You know, I can, I can listen to the, you know, Chicago Symphony play the same symphony that you're going to be doing this weekend. And, and the honest answer has to be yes and no. The process of listening and hearing sound in a live space that's being produced in the same room that you're in is unlike anything that can be produced on even the best stereo. I mean, the sound is better than anything you can hear. But the performances that you hear on these great recordings are the greatest orchestras that have ever existed in, in dozens and dozens of takes pieced together to attain a level of perfection that, frankly, is, is impossible to obtain in live performance. But the more important aspect of being in that live audience is in the experience of sitting next to someone while you're hearing these pieces of music together. Now, a composer uh, often writes in solitude. The composer will write in, in his or her own studio and put notes to paper, or, or more realistically, probably type notes into a computer. And when the composer's finished, we have a piece of music. But that piece of music doesn't come alive. It isn't realized until a community of people come together to play it, and another community of people come together to listen to it. So musical composition can exist in isolation and solitude, but music itself can't exist without a community. <coughs> So what I'm going to ask you to do right now is for just a moment, I'm going to play a short excerpt for you here. And this short excerpt is about a minute long. It's the end of, whoops, there it goes. It's already gone. I'm going to go back. It's the end of Mahler's Ninth Symphony. And it's a, Mahler's a great romantic composer. He was troubled. And, and in this work, he's really bidding farewell to, to his earthly existence. I want you to just close your eyes and think about how you're experiencing this sound right here in this room right now. this beautiful conclusion, 
this poor guy in the front row, his iPhone went off and it rang and it rang and it rang and it rang until the conductor finally had to stop the orchestra and turn around and say, please turn off your phone. And the, the online community, the classical music community, just lit up. They were just incensed. I mean, they wanted to lynch this poor guy. I, I feel bad for him. They wanted to lynch this poor guy. And they said, it's a, you know, words like throwing mud on the Mona Lisa. Now, I have to say, I'm, I'm sorry that a great performance was interrupted, but I'm not sorry that this happened. Because it was that response that shows how precious this experience of coming together was. If these people had been sitting at home listening to their recording of Mahler's Ninth Symphony and their phone rang at the end, what would happen? Nothing. They'd either answer the phone or they'd let it go. But the fact that it happened in this space that we almost consider to be a sacred space because we're together was so appalling and it pointed out something very important, which is that today, in this time when we bemoan the lack of community and the isolation that technology can bring to us. The act of coming together and witnessing something together binds us in a way that very little else does. And so when you're in that audience sitting next to someone and you hear that collective intake of breath or the spontaneous happens between movements, or even a phone going off at the end of Mahler's Ninth Symphony, it points out how connected and interconnected we are. So when you're sitting next to someone in your hometown hall and you're going on the journey that is Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, you're creating a bond with those people who are with you, and a bond to our community, and a bond, a connection to our future together. And so I think we can see that live classical music is extremely impractical, and yet very, very practical. Thank you very much.